Hello, good morning and shalom, everyone. Shalom. Welcome to, to the beginning of our service here at Acts Reformed Church in West Covina, California. This is actually the Sunday school, the, the worship part where we get into the, the worship music and the sermon will start at 1030. Uh, so today, we're, what I'm going to do is inst- uh, we, we have the Q&A. We haven't actually started the, the new series that we're going to start doing. Uh, so what I'm going to do in, in order to save some time is I'm going to I'm going to answer five questions that were submitted by email uh, about a week ago, and I'll, I'll try to answer those as quickly as I can. And then after we're done with those five questions, we'll try to take questions from from the people here in the congregation. So so I'll try to get them as quickly as I can. Uh, Brother Kelvin, do you have them ready? Or? Yes, I have. Okay. So uh, question one: What exactly is the gospel, and why is it important that we share it? Okay, so this is a really important question because when you're discussing the issue, the, in Romans 1.16, Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So how do we understand it? The word gospel in the Greek, uh, evangelium, if I remember correctly, I don't remember if I'm butchering the, the word, in the Greek, it means good news. So when you see this is the good news, why is the good news good news? Well, because of the condition that mankind fi- finds himself in. So let's begin by the bad news. The bad news is that God is holy and his law is just. God is holy and his law is just. So God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is pure. He is completely immaculate. There is not a single defect. There is no limitation in God. There's nothing unholy, unclean, nothing sinful. God is perfect and holy in every way. But that God also has a law. These are the, this, is, this is a reflection of his character. We usually see this in, reflected in the Ten Commandments, which we, we've talked about during the Sunday schools. And so the Ten Commandments are a reflection or an extension of the character of God. They're revealing something about who God is. And so therefore... Because this is the character of God, because this is what is right and what is wrong, we, as his creation, need to live according to that standard. The problem is that we haven't, and as we covered in the Sunday schools, we also can't. Number two is, this is B, man is fallen in Adam and justly condemned by God's law on the day of judgment and resurrection. So the other aspect is that there, so not only do we have a law, but we're on the day of judgment, we're going to be judged for the law that we fail to, to live by. So, so we have mankind is created, we're fallen in Adam, we cannot submit to God's law, we cannot pursue God, we cannot achieve that we cannot achieve that justification on the basis of law. So if we can't follow God's law, and God requires us to follow the law in order to justify us, then what do we do? The answer is nothing. We cannot do anything to remedy the situation. That's why the gospel is good news. Gospel good, good news in Greek, it says, Jesus lived the perfect life we could not live and died as a substitute, active passive obedience of Christ for those that are in him. So Jesus Christ lives the perfect life that we could not live. He dies on the cross as our sacrifice. He substitutes for us and he pays. As our substitute, he pays for our sins. And so this is where we talked about the doctrine of justification, which was covered by Brother Eric during the Sunday school. Uh, in, on the cross, our sin is transferred to the account of Jesus and in our justification, the righteousness of Jesus Christ and his righteous death are transferred to our account. And so when we are in the presence of God, God sees only the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine of justification. It says, uh, the empty tomb vindicates Jesus to be God in human flesh and promise, the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. The fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day proves that he was everything he said he was. Anyone can say, I am God and I am all these wonderful things. Then the person dies and then that's the end of their story. Jesus actually didn't finish his story on the cross. His story continues on in the resurrection, his appearances and ascension. And his story is still not finished because he's still supposed to come back someday. Without the resurrection, Jesus is just another false Messiah and Christianity is worthless. So that's the, the answer to the first question. Question two, if one holds a wrong view of the solas or five points of Calvinism or Arminianism or creation, can one be saved? Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. You didn't answer the second part of the question. Which part? The part that says why is it important that we share this. 
Oh, okay. Yes, well, the import, the well, basically, it's because Romans one sixteen says that it is the power of God unto salvation, and so man cannot, he, not man cannot come to faith in Jesus Christ unless the word of God is communicated. So it, it's it, it's impossible outside of some sort of special grace, a person cannot receive. I mean, obviously, questions arrive about what about children that die before they're able to consciously hear the word of God and come to faith. But the but the issue is that man cannot come to faith in Jesus Christ unless they first have faith. And how can we do that unless there's a preacher? And, you know, unless there are the people that bring that news. Uh, well, that's... Uh, unless there, we don't have evangelism without people preaching it. That's, that's what we covered in the Great Commission. The Great Commission was covered in the Sunday schools. So... So, uh, question two, if one holds a wrong view of the solas or the five points of Calvinism or Arminianism or creation, can one be saved? The answer is the, doc- the, the doctrine of salvation is not that you have to be able to articulate all the doctrines properly. In other words, I don't believe that when the apostles were walking around that they, they were saying, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia. They weren't articulating these doctrines in the way. We, the, the reason why these creeds are articulated the way they are is because the creeds and the confessions are written in response to developments that come later. So, for example, uh, we don't find the, the, the apostles writing the New Testament in the language of the Creed of Chalcedon or Athanasius or the Apostles' Creed. Why? Well, because the apostles weren't dealing with Manichaeans. They weren't dealing with Monothelites and Monophysites and Nestorians, which we could probably talk about that in other Sunday schools. But these are doctrinal heresies that developed later on in history. And as a result, the church, as they wrestle with these particular controversies, they start formulating their particular doctrines. So what we have in in the Bible is the bare minimum, of course, is understanding who God is, who Jesus is, that he died on the cross. So, in, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, you have the, the, one of the earliest creeds that we have of the church, namely that Jesus had died on the cross, was buried, rose from the dead, and made appearances. That is, that, that's really a bare-knuckles aspect of the gospel. Peter, Paul is not giving us an, an expansion on that creed because at that time they were not dealing with many of the controversies that we're dealing with today. So, uh, so answer. No one no, does. <clears throat> no one does not have a master every point of theology to be saved. Tony Cost explains. Creeds are the creeds are the means by which Christians confess what it is that they, as a body of believers, believe. It is important to note that while creeds are positive in one respect, they are also negative. That is, while they clearly state what it is that Christians believe, they also clarify what it is that Christians do not believe. In this way, creeds do double duty in that they simultaneously affirm and negate certain beliefs in logic. This principle is known as the law of excluded middle, which states that alternatives are excluded. A A cannot be A or non-A, but it cannot be both. This is from his book, Early Christian Creeds. So just to clarify on that point. Yes, brother. So something to add. Mm-hmm. Somebody cannot adhere to the system of nine and, of course, be saved. Mm-hmm. Um, one important thing about defining and being specific in what we believe is that it develops in order, those are things that have developed over time in order to be clear in what it is that a particular church or a particular denomination believes mm-hmm. in. It has most often, as far as I've been able to tell, that the development of creeds and confessions was done as a response to heresy, Mm -hmm. as a response to vagueness, Mm -hmm. as a response to anything goes. Mm -hmm. And that's when godly men of the past have said, actually, we need to formulate and really be specific on what Mm -hmm. it is that we think is biblical. Mm -hmm. And then someone could either uh, affirm or deny that. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we sit here and we go, how can we be (coughs) complex and... and, uh, and, and pretty much uh, exclude. No, that's not that's not the mm-hmm. intent. Although that comes with it, mm-hmm. but the intent is what is it that we believe uh, according to what we think the Bible teaches, and, and be very clear about that. 
Yeah, uh, and also because uh, as evangel, we're you know we're, as evangelicals, it's more of an umbrella term. Evangelicals include Reformed Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Episcopalians, assuming you believe the Bible is the Word of God and not taking a liberal route. Uh, but you know it includes Lutherans, Anglicans, Methodists. It includes Presbyterians. So there, there's it's a large umbrella term, but. The, the beauty of freedom, and may, maybe this is the ugliness of evangelicalism, is that we're so divided and have all these denominations and we have infighting. So there is a negative and a positive to this. The fact that we're fighting a lot of, and arguing with each other on a number of issues is somewhat of a bad thing. But the beauty in, that you, I find in it is that we're allowed to, uh, to disagree and we cannot force a Presbyterian church to, to be a Reformed Baptist and Presbyterians can't force us to be Presbyterians. And, and the same thing, Lutherans, we can't force them to hold to the 1689, and they can't hold, force us to hold to their particular confession. So we're allowed to have agreement on the central issues. Uh, there's a famous uh, quote that is attributed to Augustine where he says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, love or charity, as it is in the Latin. So in all things, charity or love. And this is in the Latin, of course. He says, uh, question three, what exactly is necessary for salvation? Answer, the gospel needs to be proclaimed by the church. There, there you go, brother. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. For I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15.3-4. Now there are Aramaisms that many biblical scholars point to in 1 Corinthians 15.3-4, namely that Paul, Paul here is delivering a tradition that had been given to him when he converted to Christianity, and now he's just passing on. So the words found in verses 3 and 4 are not words that were authored by Paul. These were words that were given to Paul, and Paul is now repeating to the Corinthians. So the, so the earliest reference that we have to it is in Paul, but Paul is not the author of those particular words. It is God the Holy Spirit who will regenerate the unbeliever, giving him or her faith and repentance. What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord uh, gave to each one I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, 3 5 through 7. So we, we see that as the gospel is proclaimed through missions or even just in your family, if your family is willing to listen to you, because uh, as Jesus said, a prophet is not accepted in his own country. But if you have an opportunity to witness to the people in your own family, the people at work, because witnessing can take place in a lot of different ways. One of the things that I was reading recently is that when you are out in the world and you're talking to people, say that they're at work, say they're at home, wherever it may be, and you, you tell them about the Bible, chances are they may actually have a Bible at home. They just don't read it. It's just collecting dust. Or if they don't have a physical Bible, they can actually access one electronically. You can actually go on the Internet and read the Bible on the internet, or you can download electronic versions of it or apps that you can do it. And yet with all of the accessibility of the Bible, so many people don't read it. Well, what I was reading is that one of the things that you need to know is that a lot of times the only exposure that non-believers will have to the gospel message and to the word of God is you. In other words, you will be that gospel that, that they will read because they're going to look at you, they're going to look at your, your life, they're going to see how you speak and how you behave, and that's going to be the all they know about Christianity because they're not going to pick up this book. They're not going to pick this up and, and read it, but they will scrutinize you. <clears throat> so, question four. Do you have to have a lot of head knowledge or theological knowledge to share the gospel? Answer, No. But we do need to know the basics to preach the whole counsel of God. For I did not shrink back, shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Acts 20, 20, 27. Okay, so <clears throat> does a person have to be able to articulate? I, I've had this conversation with people. Let's, let me use the Trinity as an example. We try to teach children the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, one of the things I think would be great is to teach kids the Athanasian Creed or the Nicene Creed. Some people learn how to recite this particular creed. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But what I'm saying is that a, ch a child, let's say you have a child that's 12 years old, boy or girl. 
do they have to be able to recite by memory the Athanasian Creed, which explains the doctrine of the Trinity? The answer is no. But in order to have a, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they do need to know the simplicity of the gospel, namely that Jesus has died as our substitute. If you don't have a, a death, burial, and resurrection, we have no gospel. There is no resurrection. The gospel does not exist. There is no salvation. We are still in our sins. So the, you don't have to be able to articulate the, Lord, the London Baptist Confession of Faith 1689, uh, but, but one of the things that I, I find interesting is that in the early church, they would actually have, before the people would get baptized, I'm talking about the catechumens, the people that were converts to Christianity, is that in some cases they would actually ask them to recite a, a creed which was later formulated into what we know of as the Apostles' Creed. And so, you know, we believe in one Father, God, creator of the heaven and the earth, and Jesus Christ, and they would actually have them. That would be the bare minimum aspect of the gospel presentation, which I think is helpful because it doesn't get too deep. But, it, but in fact, there are so many books that you can buy on the Apostles' Creed because the, it dates back to the time of the early church fathers. So it's like 1,200 years old, maybe older, depending on what version of the creed, because there were earlier versions of this creed where the East and the West would have different phrases, but that's a different conversation. But when you look at the creed itself, it was a formulation of the most basic bare knuckles, that's my phrase, bare knuckles version of the gospel. When you go into later times, when you look at one of the most celebrated confessions of faith, of course, is the Westminster Confession of Faith, which our confession, the, London, the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689, is largely based on. It's basically a baptized, Baptist version of the Westminster. Yes, sister. Can you read that Apostles' Creed so we know what it says? Um, let me pull it up. I don't have it in front of me. Okay, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell, or Hades, as we talked about in the Sunday schools. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, that's the word universal, church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Uh, that is the true Christian church of all times of all, and all places. So this is, this is really basically the bare knuckles aspect. You don't have to get into Trinitarian theology. Yes, sister. Exactly. Yes. Yes, but but the thing but the thing about the Apostles' Creed is it can be used as a prayer, I, I suppose. But but uh, what I'm saying is that the Apostles' Creed is something that needs to be studied. Like the, I just read to you a very bare knuckles creed, but the creed is actually responding to things. There were there was an early group known as the Gnostics. The Gnostics denied that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. They believed that Jesus was that he appeared to be human, that he appeared to have a human flesh but they didn't believe that he was truly a human being. So they didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. So this creed is specifically responding to that, saying, no, Jesus Christ was physical. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He died on the cross, was buried, rose again on the third day. And, and then it talks about our resurrection in the flesh. So when you're dealing with the Apostles' Creed, you, you can do Sunday schools, which, I'm at, which I talked about with Pastor Gerardo, that maybe I could do a whole series on the Apostles' Creed and examining every line. And we could go through this for a few months because there's so much depth to it that we can expand on. Yes, sir. But I think answering the question, you don't even have to know the Apostles' Creed word by word, but you just no. know every idea. You have a sin problem. Mm -hmm. Christ has no sin. He mm -hmm. died in our place. He was buried. He rose again. And right. Because of that, he had eternal life. So the nutshell of the gospel is in the creed. Yes. But you don't have to even know the creed to preach the gospel. Exactly. It's simply an articulation that allows you to deny. Be because 
anyone can use certain language and say, for example, a oneness Pentecostal wouldn't have a problem with the Apostles' Creed. A oneness Pentecostal who denies the doctrine of the Trinity. Because the Apostles' Creed doesn't address that particular issue. But the Apostles' Creed is affirming. So if you were to have the church never confronting Gnosticism, the Apostles' Creed would probably be worded differently because it wouldn't be responding to some of these other issues. So uh, question five. What, a, what about to be saved? I'm sorry. What about to be saved? Do you have to have perfect theology and have all the answers? Answer, no, we will never know God's truth the way God knows it. God alone is infallible. The Holy Scriptures provide us with sufficient knowledge, not exhaustive knowledge. There's a big difference. I have a relative who always argues that if we don't know, if we don't have all the information, that means that we can't know anything. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a middle ground. You can have sufficient knowledge without having all knowledge. You don't have to be all-knowing to know some things. So in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, here's an interesting point that Paul gives. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. So Paul is anticipating that Christians in the church are going to disagree. And he says that there is an element of good that exists in that. Not, not, that, we're, not that Paul is encouraging that we argue amongst ourselves, but he's encouraging that we not necessarily just have to agree with each other. Uh, I remember there was a, there was a quote from uh, the late Don, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Uh, I learned this from his disciple, Walter Martin, from his cassette tapes that I listened to back when I was a kid before mp3s were around and he used to say whenever you have two people that think alike in every respect one of them is not thinking so uh, that's the end of the five questions that were submitted by email so we have about 10 minutes that we can deal with any Q&A's I think you did a little pre-game for these questions you can the answer so um Well, yes. I mean, one of the one of the most amazing things about the Bible is that when you're looking at the great saints of the past in the Old Testament, uh, you look at people like Samson, David, Moses killed a guy. Uh, so you have all of these particular saints the, the, that are mentioned both in the Old and New Testament. Peter, for example. One one of the things I find interesting is that Peter he was the chief influence behind the Gospel of Mark. For everybody, for those that may not know, Mark was not an apostle. Mark was a companion of the apostles, a companion of Paul, and a companion of Peter. And so when, when you look at Mark's gospel, it is the one that portrays Peter in the most negative light. So the one that had the most Petrine influence is the one that portrays Peter in the most negative light. And so the interesting thing, that the thing that I find most fascinating and beautiful is that the Bible doesn't conceal the sins of these great saints it actually tells us they did some horrible, horrible things. I look at King David. This is a guy that sent a man to die in war just so that he could have his wife. There are unregenerate people who are not that despicable. This is a horrible thing. And yet, the Bible refers to him as a man of righteousness. So when you're looking at the, the story of Lot, Lot is a man who the Bible refers to as being a righteous man. And this is a man who we... we, we tend to try to look at the culture of that time. And so it's kind of weird that you have these, uh, these uh, homosexual men that are coming up to Lot, trying to get with these two angels, and Lot offers his daughters as a, as a kind of like a peace offering, I guess, to, to basically say, well, instead of these men, why don't you take these women, these daughters of mine? And, uh, and it's, it's weird for, for modern ears to, for us to do this. And, and it's a great question because... To me, that's very immoral. But that's the whole point about the saints. The saints do things that are immoral. So there is a situation where after the, the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, 
uh, Lot leaves Sodom and Gomorrah with his two daughters, but his wife, they're told not to look back. His wife looks back, and the Bible tells us that she turns to salt. Well, Lot's daughters think that they are the last of the human race and that they need to repopulate the earth. And so they decide, uh, the older daughter decides to, to tell the younger daughter, why don't, I get, why don't we get our father drunk? I will lay with him. And then tomorrow we'll get him drunk, and then you lay with him. That way we can repopulate the earth. And so this is an example of incest. And, and then you're dealing with the fact that incest, it, we consider that to be a sin today be, because of the bloodline and because the law of Moses also tells us that it was not allowed. But then when you look in the book of Genesis, uh, for all intents and purposes, Eve is actually Adam's sister. Uh, not because they're siblings, but because she came out of him. So their genetic code would have been very close. And so when you look at Cain and Abel, who are they marrying? Or, or Seth, who are they marrying? They're marrying sisters, possibly nieces. So these, it's a complicated issue because you're talking about a different time period. But to, uh, to address this particular question directly, I would say, and the Bible doesn't actually tell us in so many words Lot was saved, but yes, it is possible for Lot to, to be saved in spite of egregious sins like that because the Bible values repentance, not a repentance of attrition. This is where you're sorry that you got caught, not because you don't feel any sorrow that you did something wrong. You just feel sorry that you got caught and you might actually get punished for it. But contrition... This is where you're actually sorry that you did something wrong. You have offended God and his law. And so, uh, so it's very possible that Lot is saved. So, so you're not certain if the Bible describes someone's righteous if they're saved? Yeah, I'm not. Well, I mean, that would suggest that he is. But like I said, it depends on in what context. I mean, for example, Job is referred to as perfect, but that doesn't mean he was sinless. So I would suggest that he probably was saved on the basis of that. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? We've got five minutes left if anyone... Brother James? Did you have a question? Or? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll ask a question more because you're more of an expert on it than I am. Okay. In terms of the books of the Bible that yeah. the Catholic Church claims that Protestants removed. Yeah. And so forth. Oh, Okay. All right. And of course, I'm not an expert, but thank you very much for the flattering comment. <laughs> okay, so one of the claims that is made by Roman Catholic apologists, so if you listen to like Catholic answers and stuff like that, they'll say that, well, the church has always recognized the apocryphal books. So that, that includes like First and Second Maccabees, Baruch, Tobit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and and, the, and the, the expanded version of the book of Daniel, it has the story of the dragon and the children. So, so they will say the church has always recognized these books, and all throughout church history that you recognize the books as inspired. And then Luther, it, something happened in a debate regarding the subject of prayers for the dead. And he decided to throw out all the apocryphal books. But be before that, everyone recognized them to be true. These, of course, are, I'm not going to say half-truths, maybe they're quarter-truths. <laughs> well, so number one, the apocryphal books were not recognized by the Jewish people. The Jewish people, we, we know what their canon was because there, there are studies have been that, that have shown that there were a certain select group of books in the Old Testament, which they don't call the Old Testament, they call the Tanakh, the, the Law of the Prophets and the Writings. So the Tanakh, they had certain books that composed the Tanakh that were put laid up in the temple. And those were the books that were deemed the books that made the hands clean. And those books did not include the apocryphal books. Now, however... When the Septuagint was translated, if everyone remembers, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was originally written in Hebrew with some portions in Aramaic. In the Septuagint copies that we have, the apocryphal books are there. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand, and some Roman Catholics don't understand this, is that just because a book... remember. Back then, there weren't Barnes and Nobles and CBDs. There weren't electronic books that you could just download on the Internet. Books were very expensive and very few people could read. And so a church could have a collection of books that were in their, their volume, but not all of them were considered canonical in the sense of inspired. And so they, they would have these books that were called proto-canonical. These are the books that are recognized to be God's word. And then they had these other books known as edifying and ecclesiastical, but not books upon which you are to base doctrine. And you will find a tradition. Now, among the church fathers, this is where it gets a little complicated. Among the church fathers, you have church fathers that believe that the apocryphal books are scripture. 
For example, Augustine, the, the uh, Archbishop of North Africa, I'm sorry, the Bishop of North Africa, he believed that the apocryphal books were scripture. He thought, and he was ignorant about this, he thought they were in the Jewish Bible. He didn't know that they weren't. Now, Jerome, on the other hand, now this is an interesting thing because Jerome is probably the greatest biblical scholar of the church fathers, but he's not the best theologian and the best philosopher that everyone gives to Augustine. Augustine, however, was, was inferior to, to Jerome when it came to his biblical scholarship. So Augustine held that the apocryphal books were scripture because he believed in the Septuagint. Jerome believed in translating from the Hebrew, and he knew that the Jews rejected the apocryphal books. So Jerome, when he translated his Bible, he didn't translate initially the apocryphal books. But then when the Bishop of Rome, uh, Pope Damasus, now... When I say Pope Damasus, I do not be, I'm not saying that he believed he was the infallible vicar of Christ. The, many of the concepts of the Pope that exist today did not exist at the time of Jerome. But the Bishop of Rome, Pope Damasus, had asked Jerome to translate the apocryphal books. And so Jerome went ahead and did so. And in the introduction of the books, he said, these are edifying and ecclesiastical, but not books upon which you are to base doctrine. And he designated them as apocrypha. So... When you're going through the church history, you find these two traditions among the fathers. You have the fathers that knew the most about the Hebrew, rejecting the apocryphal books, and the fathers that believed that the apocryphal books were inspired. So you had these two traditions that exist throughout the patristic era, all the way through the Middle Ages. There was a scholar by the name of John Cosin who actually cataloged a list of theologians from the time of the church fathers to the Middle Ages all the way to the time of the Reformation, all who rejected the apocryphal books. So nothing that Luther said regarding the apocryphal books was new. It was well known to the church fathers, well known to the medieval theologians. Uh, William Webster wrote a book about that, how there was this book called the Glossa Ordinaria, which was a very popular book in the Middle Ages. And in the book, it also gives the same view of Jerome, namely that they weren't, uh, they, they weren't canonical in the sense of being inspired. In fact, Jerome, when, when Martin Luther translated his Bible he included the apocryphal books with them with the caveat that they were not inspired. So he didn't say anything new. It was, well, it was well known and established. And when Luther nailed the 95 Thesis, after he was called to have the, the, the conversation with Cardinal Cajetan, if, if anyone's ever seen the movie Luther with uh, Joseph Fiennes, okay, there's a scene in the movie where he's told that you know, he has to meet with Cardinal Cajetan and he has to kind of lay flat on the floor, face down, and then when Cayetan gets up, he's supposed to kind of sit up on his knees, right? That Cardinal Cayetan agreed with Luther about the Apocrypha. It was not until the Council of Trent in 1546 that the Roman Catholic Church officially canonized those books as Scripture. They, but there was before that time, there was a conversation going on Within, within the church fathers, medieval theology, and uh, up to the time of the Protestant Reformation. So th this isn't something that... And, and then, of course, Protestant Bibles, if you look at the King James Bible from 1611, it also included the apocryphal books. The, the, the apocryphal books were not removed from Protestant Bibles until about the 19th century because we didn't consider them inspired. But, but the fact is, no one is saying, now, I would never tell anyone, please don't read the Apocrypha. No, I encourage you, read the Apocrypha. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And a lot of times, the New Testament writers, they show familiarity with the Apocryphal books, and they will, either, they will usually allude to them. But the issue, when you're looking at the New Testament, is that when the New Testament quotes from the Tanakh, the Scriptures, they will usually, usually use certain phrases they will usually say things like, have you not read? God has said, scripture says, the law is written, the word of God. They will usually use these types of uh, terminology. And B.B. Warfield wrote a book where he covered a lot of this material. The church fought, I'm sorry, the apostles never used that language for the apocryphal books or the pseudepigraphal books. But the idea that Luther, that everyone recognized them as inspired and that Luther threw them out is a very bad myth. And it's based not on half-truths, it's based on like quarter-truths, if that. So I don't know if that satisfies the question. All right, so let me see. I think we can close with the prayer then. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we were able to, to just honor your word and to just 
learn and grow and uh, let us help us to submit to your lordship and to your word so that we may be better servants, better husbands, better wives, better sons, brothers, in every way, shape, or form that we may bring glory to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, amen.